um, hosting me in Madison um, this year, which has been so far and promises to remain, I hope, a wonderful year. And um, I'm really enjoying your great collection in the library. And thank you for inviting me um, to speak um, in this forum. Um, before I begin, I just want to say at the outset that this talk is part of a larger project that I'm writing in collaboration with my um, very good friend and colleague from Ben Gurion University, um, um, Professor Eitan Bar Yosef. So this is part of a joint project um, that we're working on together. <clears throat> okay. So, emergency fictions. Rohinton Mystery's powerful 1995 novel, A Fine Balance, concludes with the story of the state of emergency imp imposed by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi from June 1975 to March 1977. Ishvar and Om, the novel's protagonists, undergo all the horrors of Gandhi's emergency. Violent displacements, arrests, forced family planning procedures, all in the name of progress and modernity. In the novel's climax, the two cousins are captured and sent to a sterilization camp. Om, in retribution for defiantly spitting at a local racketeer who had murdered his father, is castrated. Ishvar undergoes the Nusbandi, the sectomy operation, but, but the sterilization operation, simple, simple and painless according to the government spokesman, goes terribly wrong. Gangrene spreads through Ishvar's legs, which are then duly amputated. By the time they return from the camp, Om and Ishvar discover that their friend and benefactor, Ashraf Chacha, has been beaten to death. Yet the trains throughout this time are on time, creating an evident tension between the emergency, by definition a time of crisis, irregular and unusual events, and the stable recurring regularity of the train's strange punctuality. Indeed, the entire chapter narrating these utmost horrors, climactic even within this unrelenting novel, is permeated with an odd sense of regularity, stability, commensurability, and cyclicality. It begins appropriately enough <clears throat> with the arrival of the chapter I'm talking about, begins appropriately enough with the arrival of the train carrying Om and Ishvar into town. To their surprise, their friend is there to greet them. How did you know we were coming today? I didn't, he smiled, but I knew it would be this week. And the train rolls in at the same hour every day. This image of Chacha at the railway stations establishes the iterative move of the entire chapter, where an event described only once, Chacha waiting at the train station, evokes a regular repetition of the, safe, the self same event. The cousin soon realized that Chacha waited there at the same time every day of the week. Indeed, the chapter is replete with images and themes characterized by successive cyclical repetitions. <clears throat> Consider the following image, depicting the activity in the station once the train has left. But the emptiness was transitory. Slowly more than a dozen figures materialized from the shadows of the sheds and storehouses. Lapped in rags, wrapped in hunger, they lowered their brittle bodies over the edge of the platform onto the rails and began moving systematically down the tracks from sleeper to sleeper searching for the flotsam of railway journeys, bending now and then, collecting the garbage of travelers. When two hands grabbed the same prize, there was a tussle. The wood and gravel underneath where the WC had halted was wet, stinking, buzzing with flies. The tattered army retrieved paper, food scraps, plastic bags, bottle tops, broken glass, every precious bit jettisoned by the departing train. They tucked it away in their gunny sacks, then melted into the shadows of the station to sort their collections and await the next train. The emptiness of the train is metonymically in transit, implying a constant state of flux. In this description, the figures pick up the debris only once, but the narrative implies that it is a constant action, repeated after the disappearance of every train. The iterative mode is established simultaneously by the overabundance of details and an underdetermination of the characters. The passage is incredibly detailed, describing every movement, listing the different pieces of debris collected. These details create a sense of repetition, of bending over and over again to pick up the next in a seemingly endless series of items, paper, food scrap, plastic bags, bottle tops, broken glass. The work is described as quite systematic, and as soon as it ends, there is nothing left to do but, quote, await the next train. 
However, while the minutiae of this degrading labor are painstakingly elaborated, the particularity of the laborers themselves is, is, is effaced. They are, quote, figures who materialize from the shadows and melt back into them. The figures are described as a group that lack any specificity beyond their role as rag pickers. They have no gender, no color, no dress, except that which marks their destitution, lapped in rags, wrapped in hunger. Not only are they not differentiated from each other, they cannot be differentiated from any, any other, quote, tattered army in the Indian railway stations. The result is a prod portrait of destitution, all the more so because it is, in a sense, infinitely perpetuated. The effect is curious. Against the resigned, iterative background described above, the emergency does not create a sharp contrast. In fact, it, seemed like it seems like more of the same. A few pages later, market day was noisier than usual because the family planning center was promoting its sterilization camp from a booth in the square. In other words, it's always noisy on market day, and the emergency just makes it slightly more so. More broadly, and yet following a similar logic, the emergency only slightly exacerbates the already difficult lives of the population, reframing it in the context of sterilization. This is especially true of their lower castes. The novel implies that the poor and disenfranchised have always been at the mercy of the powers that rule them. For them, it is immaterial whether the violence which oppresses them originates from the local zamindar, as it has from time immemorial, or from the central government in New Delhi, as it does now. The image of the train, on time only during the emergency, establishes the anticlimactic, anti-emergency tone of this chapter and even of the novel as a whole. While it might seem far-fetched to conclude that the emergency is just another iteration of lower, class, uh, lower caste oppression, Mystery's brand of realism brings to the fore what I recognize as the central tension of the representation, fictional and non-fictional, of the emergency. A tension between a discourse of crisis, excess, and anomaly, and one of cohesion and historical continuity. In fact, I argue that this tension exists not only in hindsight, when we consider the period's legacy, but rather was constitutive of the emergency itself. Indeed, the tension between crisis and continuity, right, is con itself is continuous, visible in the literature written just before the crisis and immediately following it. In other words, the stakes of this discursive battle between, again, crisis and continuity are not only in determining the ways in which the emergency will be remembered, but even more so understanding how the emergency was, was understood, indeed what the emergency actually was as it was taking place. <clears throat> the emergency began in the early hours of June 26, 1975. Speaking on, all, speaking on All India Radio, Indira Gandhi informed a stunned nation that President Farrakhuddin had proclaimed a state of emergency. There is nothing to panic about, she said. This is a necessary response to the deep and widespread conspiracy which has been brewing ever since I began to introduce certain progressive measures to benefit the common man and woman of India. The immediate trigger, as many of you may know, was the ruling of the Allahabad High Court exactly two weeks earlier, which declared Gandhi's election null and void due to misconduct in her election campaign in 1971. More generally, Gandhi's increasing power and authoritarianism prompted the rise of oppositional forces led by one of her father's closest friends, the universally loved former independence activist Jeprakash Narayan, known as JP. Threatened by these oppositions, the Prime Minister acted swiftly and ruthlessly. Across the country, tens of thousands were detained without trial and sent to jail, many, where many were tortured. JP and other oppositional leaders were arrested and kept in government rest houses in Del near Delhi. Elections for the parliament and for state governments were postponed. <clears throat> the constitution was amended. Houses and bazaars were demolished. And in all in the name, oh, sorry, houses and bazaars were demolished in the name of slum eradication or beautification. And then the emergency ended as abruptly as it began. On January 18th, 1977, 
The Prime Minister astonished the nation yet again when she announced that Parliament was to be dissolved and elections were to be held. Anthropologist Emma Tarlow claims that our contemporary understanding of the emergency has been mythologized, that's her word, through two opposing and consecutive narratives. The first was the official narrative of the emergency propagated at the time of the emergency by Indira Gandhi, her son Sanjay, and numerous politicians, bureaucrats, officials, and journalists. <clears throat> According to this narrative, by controlling population growth, increasing production, boosting agriculture, encouraging industry, abolishing socially backward customs, clearing slums and rooting out corruption, India could achieve new levels of greatness. Modernity was the goal and the emergency was the means to attain it. The second narrative created post-emergency by Gandhi's opponents focuses on the authoritarian and anti-democratic means of the emergency, presenting the measures taken in its name as an outcome of Gandhi's personal political crisis rather than a national or social one. Even later, following Gandhi's surprise return to power in 1980, surprising return to power in 1980, and her assassination in 1984, the emergency seems to have been relegated to the status of anomaly in India's democratic history. As noted, intellectual Ashish Nandi has noted, as a moment of national shame, a blot on India's democratic record, the emergency has been built as more as more as a moment for forgetting than as one for remembering. After the mid-1980s, the emergency seems largely to disappear from public and academic discourse, except, as we shall see, for its prominence in literary fiction. Tarlow argues that these two narratives, locked into their partisan rhetoric, cannot provide a reliable account of the emergency. I choose to revisit these narratives by looking more closely at the ways in which existing side by side these narratives, right, the one that says the emergent, the sort of, that was promoted at the time of the emergency, modernity, this is all to make a better India, necessary measures, um, and the other one as this was an authoritarian, fascist, Indira's, um, um, you know, fascist regime. Um, so, these two discourses, I argue, um, that they, if we look at them existing side by side, these narratives, I argue, participated in the construction of the emergency in Indian social and political culture. What I argue is that notwithstanding their differences, both narratives were predicated on a similar discursive tension between crisis and continuity. Constitutive of the ongoing struggle for India's political future, this tension explains how both discourses could exist concurrently, thus frustrating a rigid chronological reading of two narratives that exist on either side of a clear-cut break. So if Tarlow says, first came one, then the emergency was over, then came the other, what I want to show is that the tensions that, that built them, that, that um, constitute the emergency, were actually the same and ongoing and can't be sort of a before and after um, continuum. <clears throat> Political accounts of the emergency commonly tell the story of two rivals pitted against each other. Indira Gandhi, oh, what happened? Okay. Political accounts of the emergency commonly tell the story of two rivals pitted against each other, Indira Gandhi and J.P. Naran. When writing about the literature of this period, however, one is tempted to stage a, diff a drama between a different set of rivals, Indira Gandhi and her cousin, Nantara Saga. Her cousin, who was her cousin, a novelist and political writer, and also uh, the, she's the daughter of Vijayalakshmi Pandit, um, sister of Nehru, Gandhi's father, right? So you get the family relations. Um, the two women, scions of the most venerable political family in India and coming of age during the struggle for India's independence, one cousin became the first prime woman prime minister of the largest nation in the world, while the other, one of her strongest critics. Playing a central role in the story of the Indian emergency, whether as its key political player or as the dominant literary and journalistic figure, each of these two women makes a claim for the reality and realism of her vision. More precisely, they articulate competing claims for an authentic Indian nationality and politics, both the political dyad 
Gandhi JP, and the literary one, Gandhi Saga, clash over the true propagation of a Nehruvian and Gandhian legacy. However, like the cousins themselves, their two narratives are also inextricably connected and depend on each other to articulate the force of their claims. Despite their antinomy, they rely on a shared temporal logic that the past authorizes a future. In order to tease out this discursive and familial rivalry, its origins, manifestations, and implications, I will briefly introduce the various tropes employed to talk about the emergency during the affair and its immediate <coughs> aftermath, and then turn to Sagal's novels. While Sagal is not the only novelist to write of the emergency, her work, I think, is worthy of special critical attention, not only because of her personal involvement, but mainly because no other writer has paid such sustained attention to the period and its actors, producing both fiction and nonfiction. I will show that the most intriguing element of Sagal's emergency writing lies in its frustration of a coherent chronological order. As we shall see, her most compressed and persistent critique of the emergency can be found in a novel published before the emergency, while her attempts to revisit its meaning will continue almost 40 years later, as late as 2012. Like in Mystery's account above, the emergency offered a complex fusion of disruption and continuity understood in real time. The opposition found itself shifting between the representation of events as unprecedented and shocking and the opposite conviction that all this had already happened before. Some hailed JP's movement as a, quote, second freedom struggle. In his speeches, he urged the people to remain, quote, nonviolent. The, these claims pointed to the affinity between JP and the legendary Gandhi, of course, but more explosively compared the Congress party regime to the British colonial state. A similar tension characterized Indira Gandhi's justif own justification of the emergency, signifying a dramatic break from the past, modernity was the goal, but at the same time relying on a dynastic logic, her allegiance to her father, to validate and fortify her rule. The terms and tropes denoting family and family life were also central, were also central to Mrs. Gandhi's own self-fashioning as mother of India. Right, Bharat Mata was big. Speaking in, 19, in November 1975, the Prime Minister justified the emergency measures by claiming that, however dear a child may be, if the doctor has prescribed bitter pills for him, they have to be administered for his cure. Now when a child suffers, the mother suffers too. Thus we were not pleased to take this step. Ironically, this image of mother's knows, knows best was propagated just as Mrs. Gandhi was relying more. You notice that, by the way, that she's both the doctor and the mother, right? She's both prescribing the pill. And, um, this image of know Where am I? No. OK, never mind. OK, yes. Ironically, this image of mother knows best was propagated just as Mrs. Gandhi was relying more and more on the advice and support of her second son. I don't have a thing, but you can see him there, Sanjay. Um, so this is the entire um, clan. Um, indeed, the opposition often presented Indira Gandhi as dominated by an eatable passion for her own son, supporting his rise to power despite his well-known history of failure and corruption. So the whole family. Um, dynasty was used by, both by um, the proponents of the emergency and by Indira herself, and by those against it who said, oh, here we have an eatable um, relationship. While the intimacy of this mother-son relationship was central to the representation of the emergency, Sanjay's most controversial involvement in the events, and the one linked most poignantly to family life, was his major contribution to the implementation of so-called family planning programs across the country. Relying on sterilization, primarily through vasectomies, Sanjay's bureaucrats set up quotas and encouraged local activists to outdo each other, leading to widespread coercion. Some commentators suggested that the same coercive logic which forced sterilization on humans also called for a sterilization quote of the press. Within the first week of the emergency, the government had instituted a system of pre-censorship, whereby editors had to submit for scrutiny and approval material deemed to be critical of the government. Frustrated by the discrepancy between their experience of the violent events on the ground and the sanitized coverage in the Indian press, those who could 
turned to the foreign media for information and inspiration. Other relies, others relied on words of mouth to disseminate uncensored accounts. After the emergency's abrupt end in 1977, the mainstream press needed to fill in the gaps left by its compromised reporting in the past. Having reluctantly or willingly lost its ability to provide a reliable account of, it, of reality, the press needed to regain its credibility. Nevertheless, journalist attempts to unfictionalize their previous reports often ended in a muddle, merely replacing one fiction with another. Ironically, it was another fiction, literary fiction, which seems to have to become the primary discursive space where the events of 1977, 1975 to 1977 continue to be recounted and reconsidered. So this is just um, the novels published from, the, from 1980 to 1996. There's since been, um, been, been more, and um, so, so, so it is prominent. But it's, uh, that's um, a, a very um, impressive number of novels that deal with um, the emergency as a major part of them. So let's look at, at, at those novels and um, the emergency fictions. The first English novel to feature the emergency was famously Salman Rushdie's 1980 Midnight's Children. Rushdie's representation of the emergency and of Indira Gandhi is all crisis and hyperbole, hurtling towards nothing less than complete disintegration and annihilation. Put in the terms I've, just, I've been developing here, <coughs> Rushdie prefer, per, perfects the crisis discourse of the emergency to the exclusion of the continuity one. By contrast, Sagal's writing is relentlessly realistic, a hunkering down in its almost pedestrian commitment to the reality of crisis. The realis this realism, Sagal's, like that of mystery, talked about earlier, writing in her wake, I will show, has the ability to contain both crisis and continuity, and thus address its political complexity. Moreover, I argue, Sagal inscribes her credibility through this realism, establishing a plausible continuity with the past, and thus offering a conceivable possibility of an alternative future. Sagal's novels, her personal family life, and the central actors and events of Indian history and politics are all inseparable. Her first memoir, Prison and Chocolate Cake, published when, right, yes, published when she was 27, provides a fascinating glimpse into the unusual world of a young woman coming of age in the middle of the Indian independence movement, a girl for whom Mahatma Gandhi was a household guest, whose beloved uncle was India's first prime minister, and whose mother was his first ambassador to the UN. It is really worth a read. Um, Sagal thus firmly, belongs firmly to the Indian political and literary elite, and her writing often reflects and cultivates this elitism. Searching for a subaltern perspective is fruitless. It's simply not there. And to fault her for, it is, for this lack, um, as many critics have done, is beside the point, I think. Sagal's elite viewpoint is important precisely because it reveals not only the locus from which the emergency originated, but also the place from which it has been written into history. The stakes of the Indian emergency and its representation were always for the elite, even though, as usual, it was the non-elites who paid the price. The early memoir also carried a wistful tone. Sagal was, after all, at boarding school and in the United States when history was being made by her family. One gets the sense that at least some of the memoir is meant to re-inscribe Nantara in the family lore, and by extension, in the nation's history. This personal and somewhat childish desire takes on an increasingly political meaning when 25 years after her first memoir, Sagal writes her cousin's political biography. While ostensibly a critique of Indira Gandhi's authoritari authoritarian politics, the biography takes on a personal sour grapes tone, becoming strident and at points disingenuous, especially when Sagal elides or hides her personal stake in Indira's politics. Interestingly, Sagal publishes two similar versions of this biography. The first, Indira Gandhi's Emergence and Style, came out in New Delhi in 1978, immediately after the emergency. The second, Indira Gandhi, Her Road to Power, was published in New York in 1982, was targeted at a Western audience, and includes several additional chapters that chronicle Gandhi's return to power and the death of her son and heir apparent Sanjay. 
These biographies were expanded from a series of talks that Sagal gave in London and the US as early as 1974, a year before the emergency was declared. Writing and rewriting her cousin's biography became very much a preoccupation of Sagal's through the 1970s, at the same time as she was writing many of the novels I discuss here today. The Day in the Shadow, 1971, Situation in New Delhi, 1977, and Rich Like Us, 1985. Sagal's The Day in the Shadow was published four years before the emergency and ostensibly does not belong to its literature. And yet, through the fictionalized story of her failed marriage, Sagal portrays Indian society and political culture as losing its ethical and historical moorings presciently laying out the themes that would become central to the writing of the emergency. Its protagonist, Simrit, portrays Indian society and political culture as losing its ethical and historical moorings. Oh, sorry. Its protagonist, Simrit, is positioned between two men. Sam, her ruthless husband, poised to make much money from selling arms in the new Indian political economy, and Raj, a Christian member of parliament who is portrayed as an ethical anachronism in an increasingly corrupt world. Subjected to a cruel divorce settlement by her husband, she turned to his opposite, Raj. Crucially, Raj is also part of another political diet. His belief in ethical government, Gandhian values, and Nehruvian politics is contrasted with that of Sumer Singh, the up-and-coming politician who dismisses the past and is poised to sell the country's assets in the form of oil in the interest of power and greed. The personal and the political are thus intertwined in character and plot and in ideology. The gender and communal politics that doom Simrit to a cruel divorce settlement are but part of a general retreat from Gandhian values that the novel laments. Indeed, as Pranav Jani has noted, the novel's centripetal movement, quote, consistently forces Simrit to exteriorize her sorrow, to recognize that her private oppression is linked to larger structures. Through its repeated doublings, the, novel's not, the novel thus not only brings the political realm to bear on the private one, but exposes the politics inherent in the very division between the two. Raj's character links the two dyads, personal and political, but also embodies yet another duality, which is crucial to the ideology espoused by this novel and to the ones that follow. By virtue of not being Hindu, he's Christian, Raj occupies the privileged space of outsider-insider. Quote, that's what happens when you belong to a minority, he says. You look at things from the outside. You don't take them for granted. You keep sounding them out. In a sense, this is what Sagal's novels do at their very best. They use the oppositions to sound out or question that which has become taken for granted in an Indian polity and society. It is what enables Raj, unlike Simrit, to be a pragmatist and an idealist at the same time, and to present a hope for the future through a connection with the past. The Day in the Shadow, in Shadow, sorry, thus lays the ground for Sagal's overarching emergency narrative in two ways. On the one hand, by tracing a wide retreat from Gandhian values in the elite public and <coughs> private spheres, and the consequent, consequent rise of a new, corrupt, self-serving elite, which would later lead to the authoritarianism of the emergency, the novel depicts a break, a crisis, in Indian politics. On the other hand, the novel employs the character of Raj to an, an establish the counter-narrative, the road of continuity not taken, and uses it to contextualize the rapid changes that are taking place, taking India's society away from Sagal's idea. The novel does not seem hopeful about Raj's chances of overcoming the forces of power and corruption, but his constant presence as the linchpin of the no novel's two narratives underscores his importance. Sagal thus critiques the ostensibly inevitable onward rush towards progress, headed for crisis with an alternative discourse of continuity with the past. Most saliently, the other road, even when not taken, is still present in the novels. Um, the result is the continued presence of a political alternative presented as an option which is always available to those who wish to take it up. Indeed, rich like us reaps what the day in shadow sows. This is the last novel published in 1985, or the last that I'm going to be 
um, talking about here. It reaps what the day in the shadow sows. It displays the political and social disaster, which was the outcome of the a power hungry and corrupt elite whose rise to power she records in the earlier novels. Rich like us, this validates and vindicates Saga's political prescience, of which she was proud, even above boastful, while indi indicting her cousin's transgressions. The horrors of the emergency depicted in Rich Like Us in the post-emergency novel confirm her predictions in the first pre-emergency one, written well before these events. Moreover, her prescience also establishes ideological and political continuity in Sagal's work. In a time of changing allegiances and wavering principles, Sagal's voice remains constant and by implication, true. In the novel's past, the rich like us, Rose, a cockney shop girl in 1940s London, meets Ram, a sophisticated Indian merchant, and comes with him to India as his second wife. Through her naive honesty, inherent good nature, and common sense, she manages to make peace with his first wife, disarm her hostile father-in-law, keep the family together, and secure their finances. In the novel's present, during the emergency, Ram is incapacitated by a stroke, and Rose is left at the mercy of his son, Dev, a member of the, quote, fast crowd, profiting from the emergency through his proximity to, quote, the prime minister's son, and his corrupt car manufacturing scam. This emergency is just what we needed, says Dev. The troublemakers are in jail. This means things can go full steam ahead without delays and weighing pros and cons forever. Strikes are banned. It's going to be very good for business. Explicit in, explicit in describing and denouncing the corruption and illicit relations between the political leadership, the civil service, and the moneyed elite, the novel barely addresses those aspects of emergency that targeted the less privileged, namely slum eradication and sterilization. In the role of non-elite outsider, Sagal ironically prefers to visit Ro Rose. Sorry. In the role of non-elite outsider, Sagal ironically prefers to posit Rose, who is British but lower class, as the novel's noble savage, seeing through the webs of lies and deceit spread ever more tightly and widely in the emergency. Because she speaks her mind, Rose is murdered at the novel's end by the hands of her stepson's henchmen. If Rose is an outsider who makes her way in, her younger friend Sun Li is the consummate insider, daughter of the Indian Kashmiri elite and fast rising star in the ICS, the Indian Civil Service. She struggles with the increasingly terrifying gap between her ideals and workday reality. Demoted, Sun Li needs to leave the ISS to become an outsider in order to begin questioning everything she has taken for granted through an inquiry into her personal and national history. Saga thus interweaves the limited story of the characters with a larger historical context. Indeed, it seems that because the events of Rich Like Us take place during the emergency itself, portraying a time when no alternative narrative was possible, Rose is, who provides a little alternative, she's murdered, Saga turns to the long durée of Indian history to imagine an alternative. The novel again pits two discourses against each other, bearing out Tarla's claim of opposing partisan narratives. The first is the discourse of the emergency officials and their hangers-on, fraudulent and superficial. It is espoused, for example, by the minister who speaks at the dedication ceremony for Dev's corrupt car manufacture, oh, sorry, his, another ma corrupt manufacturing scheme. He speaks in mellifluous Hindi about the Vedas, the undimmed glory of India's heritage, the high place of selflessness and sacrifice in her tradition, and the brightness of the future assured by the emergency. This official discursive claim for legacy, manifestly counterfeit, serves in the novel as a foil for the second discourse, one of true and authentic continuity personified by the novel's two protagonists, Rose and Sonali, and narrative, narrators. The two women and their two narratives move closer to each other until Sonali takes over at the novel's tragic end, adopting Rose's legacy of being able to inhabit a contradiction. If a seesaw what is what I've chosen to live on, I'll live on it and make the best of it. Sonali inquiry reveals the complexity of real history rather than the counterfeit rhetoric of history such as the one espoused by the minister in the quote above. 
Musing over the improbability of Rose's accidental death, Sorry, lost my place. Accident. Moving over the improbability of Rose's accidental death, Sonali understands the connection between a local criminal untruth and the larger historical one. As she proclaims at the novel's end, do I have this? No, I don't. Here in this house, the revision of history had begun, and there would be no end to the lies. In Rich Like Us, the emergency is a struggle over history. <coughs> and its meaning in the Indian polity and over its continuity with the past. It makes explicit that India's future depends on the legacy it chooses and that the legacy must also come from the outside and be incorporated within. This all sounds good and well, but I would argue that the novel actually fails in this endeavor. Unlike Rose and Sonley's ability to contain historical complexity, the novel itself is invested in a Manichaean view of history, represented by stark and, offer super, and often superficial oppositions of authentic versus counterfeit and of right versus wrong. The result is a novel that while structurally gesturing towards a complex understanding of history and of the tension between continuity and crisis, ultimately uh, offers a reading of history of the emergency that takes on many of the characteristic of the superficiality it criticizes. So. The Rich Like Us is the novel set explicitly during the emergency. I would like to suggest that the novel which actually affords most insight into, it, into its convoluted stakes is situation in New Delhi. So it's the, of the three novels that I'm discussing, it's the one, it's the middle one in order of its publication and writing, but the last in my discussion. Despite being written before the emergency, Saga completed it in 1974, it, and published immediately in its wake. The novel uncannily anticipates many of the emergencies, events, and tropes, giving truth to Sagal's ghosts of her own prescience and political acuity. Most powerfully, the novel's very existence as simultaneously pre- and post-emergency performs what I argue is at stake in the emergency, the temporal maneuvers involved in renegotiating an Indian political legacy. The novel opens with the death of Shivraj, the idealized and barely fictionalized Nehru, and focuses on his close circle of family and confidants who cont contend with the after effects of, of this immense loss in their personal and political realms. In keeping with Prasaga's propensity for dual forms and themes, this novel also has two narrative forms. The first associated with Shivraj's sister Devi, so the fictionalized mother of um, saga, is dominant in the first part of the novel and continues the pedestrian realism of the day in the shadow. This narrative, like much realism, offers the quotidian as an institutional structure that can contain change and preser preserve continuity in crisis. The leader is gone, but nothing falls apart due to the structure in place, a structure his sister Davy describes as the bigger, slower human process of a struggle that learns through its own experience. This institutional thinking is presented as Shivraj's explicit legacy. He wanted mainly to live long enough for free institutions to become a part of the soil, become a way of life and thinking that no future could destroy. In contrast to this, the novel pits another narrative also realistic, its discourse is urgent, highlighting action and escalation, revolution and violence. Through these narrative temporalities, Sagal conducts an internal debate on Nehru's legacy and um, its temporal allegiances, to the past and to the future for sure, but also to the relative speed and rate of, pro of progress and tradition and the forms they take. As the novel progresses, urgency gains over the quotidian, the discourse of crisis having taken over in the form of a tragic bombing, sort of a Naxalite type bombing, by the novel's pessimistic end. Nevertheless, and despite its dual narrative form, situation in New Delhi is not invested in binary oppositions in the same way as Shadow of Day and Rich Like Us. In Shadow of Day, the day shadow. Um, instead, the novel focuses on a more subtle struggle one to which it provides no clear answers, the struggle over Nehru's legacy. 
It is thus a novel that both in its form and content is more interested in reflexes of analysis of how things came to be than in staging a Manichaean battle between good and bad or authentic and counterfeit. Making it, this novel, the most profound and interesting of Sagal's novels in its understanding of history, as well as the most interesting, form, intricate formal instance of the discursive struggle, which was the emergency. Literary critic Tian Dar um, argues that Sagal's novels reaffirm, quote, that the Indian tradition would provide a safeguard against violent social political alternatives, end quote. Well, I would agree. It also seems, somewhat ironically, that Indira Gandhi would also have signed on to such a statement. After all, her claims were that the emergency was the bitter pill declared precisely to safeguard the nation and tradition from those who would, who would break from it violently. Indeed, both emergency narratives, the official and the oppositional, espoused a future based on a strong connection with the past. They only differed over which one of them was the rightful representative of this past. Put in the terms of situation in New Delhi, the real debate is not between those who would follow Shivraj, the fictional Nehru, and those who would break with his ways. Rather, the strife is internal and comprehensive, a differing over what following Shivraj is or means. It is a struggle over the meaning of Nehru in post-Neruvian times. Finally, the overdetermination, this is the same, but Saga is in here now. The overdetermination of family in this contested legacy, in the novel's plot and characters, and the convoluted kinship relations between its author and her historical subject matter, become especially vexed when juxtaposed with the emergency discursive preoccupation with tropes of family and family life. This problematizes the way we, and contemporary readers, understand the novel but also has an unexpected upside if we read the various texts through each other. The somewhat crude quasi-sisterly rivalry in the second generation of India's elite, which emerges from the biography, when mirrored and problematized in the novel and then refracted in the family discourse of the emergency, offer the readers of this novel an uncanny opportunity to contemplate the relationship between family and politics and its most literal and figurative meanings. And you know, you see the picture of Rahul there, this is ongoing. Um, Coda. In 2012, at the age of 88, Sahagal publishes yet another, third version of her biography of her cousin, okay? Now entitled Indira Gandhi, Trust with Power, Trist with Power, Trist, of course, with Power. Immediately evoking Nehru's famous tryst with distant destiny speech at the moment of India's independence, the title restores Gandhi to the place Saga spent many years trying to wrest away from her, Nehru's legacy and Indian history. The second part of the, pow of the title, With Power, however, suggests that the tryst was not destined, it had to be gained and sustained through the exercise of power. Indeed, in the 12-page postscript to this edition, entitled Completing the Picture, Sagal recognizes not only the duality of Indira Gandhi and her regime, but also the fact that its true meaning is determined discursively. Sagal reflects on her cousin in a way that softens and complicates, if not rewrites outright, the harshness and unequivocal condemnation of the 367 pages and 40 odd years that preceded it. But the very fact that these two evaluations exist side by side in one volume that they are concurrent, right? So in a sense, this contains this and this contains both of them. So it's, she just adds on. And in fact, the only difference between the 2012, so we have the exact same 367 pages and then another 12 pages at the end in which she says, what, what, what do we call it, completing the picture, in which she makes like a, almost a 180 degree turn in her assessment of Indira. It's, it's fascinating. But the very fact that these two valuations exist side by side in one volume, that they are concurrent and not consecutive, provides it another twist and new meaning to the ongoing story of a political and cultural legacy in all of the denotations and connotations conjured up by this term. In conclusion, what begins is a striking opposition between two discourses on opposite sides of an ideological and temporal divide ends up as a common if complex and open-ended discursive arena which invites ongoing consideration. Of the novels to fall in Sagal's wake, 
I chose to begin this talk with Mystery's powerful intervention, in which he sustains and extends Sagal's realist form while adding yet another layer of content, the lives of the poor and castless. Read in this way, the emergency becomes an important interpretive site, especially violent and marked, a crisis, but at the same time a continuous renegotiation, iterative and intricate, of a modern Indian polity.